as we're coming on the air, Ukraine is getting one of the things it really wants, and it may get another soon, as its president basically begs for help from us and from the Europeans, with Russia refusing to let up. And more than two million people now leaving Ukraine because of that invasion. Ahead, we've got a look inside one shelter, holding families running from the violence. And we've got more on President Biden's new move to ban Russian oil imports. Why now? Why Congress wants to hit Russia even harder, and why it could make your gas prices spike even more. And the first man to go to trial for his role in the January 6th insurrection, guilty on all charges. The signal that might send to the hundreds of others arrested for their roles in the riot. Plus, lawyers for a California woman who allegedly faked her own kidnapping want her released from custody. But a federal judge says they're worried she might flee. We've got a look inside the courtroom at Sherry Papini's detention hearing that is in process as we speak. And with the first opening day already off the calendar, more baseball games could be canceled really any minute. We're going to explain why it matters that more fans are blaming the owners and the players for this fight later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and as the U.S. is ramping up some economic pressure on Russia, Ukraine's president is begging the West for even more help and getting a standing ovation for it in front of British lawmakers virtually, with President Zelensky channeling William Shakespeare and Winston Churchill saying Ukraine will not give in to Russia. Watch. These are the children that could have lived, but these people have taken them away from us. We will not give up and we will not lose. We will fight till the end at sea, in the air. We will continue fighting for our land, whatever the cost. The UN now says a million children have left Ukraine. Look at this. You're seeing some of the pictures here. This is Kyiv, Ukraine's biggest children's hospital. These kids are getting wheeled out. They're onto buses heading west. This is Sumy, where students are part of this mass evacuation along those so-called humanitarian corridors Russia and Ukraine have agreed to set up. And then you've got what's happening in Irpin, where a father is saying goodbye to his child. That's this shot right here, as he stays in Ukraine to fight. And then I want you to hear from a 10-year-old Ukrainian girl. She's now in Hungary. She says she just wants to go home. They are my toys. They are my friends. And I don't know where are my friends now. We're going to have more in a minute on President Biden's ban on Russian oil imports and on this new announcement from Poland. It's ready to send fighter jets to Ukraine through a U.S. base in Germany. But I want to start in Lviv with Cal Perry. And Cal, one of the most difficult things, I think, for people to wrap their heads around is the shelters that we're seeing where you are in Lviv um, and throughout the sort of that part of the country. You talk to a woman who's in one of them after she tried to get away from what's happening in eastern Ukraine, all that violence there. Tell me what you're hearing. Yeah, and I think we've reached a point now, sadly, where it's not just the violence that is starting to kill people, it's the conditions on the ground here. In some of these cities, there's been no power, no heat for a week. Um, we heard yesterday the president of Ukraine, President Zelensky, saying that a girl died of dehydration in Mariupol. We can't independently confirm that, but it's consistent with the reports we're hearing in these cities, where it's not just the shelling, it's the cold, it's the lack of water, it's the lack um, of electricity. Um, in speaking to folks who have fled the country, and these are still internally displaced peoples. These are not even included in that number of two million people from the UN. We're trying to figure out or get a better idea of what is the moment that people choose to make that decision. What is that last straw that forces people from their homes? I had a chance to talk to a mother who fled recently uh, with her daughter. Here's a little bit of her story, Hallie. When uh, we hear the sound explosions, so we decided that uh, the best way for our children to go out of uh, the war, maybe abroad, uh, best, best way, best chance. A bit of good news, as you mentioned, in Sumi, we saw 5,000 people get out on one of these humanitarian corridors. It really is the first success we've seen in any of these humanitarian corridors. Mariupol um, was supposed to have one today. It failed. The buses were headed to that city. The shelling continued, um, and so the buses were unable to get anybody out of that city. Which is so, you know, hard to think about when you're looking at the civilians who are trying to get to safety. We know that um, President Zelensky has also asked Boris Johnson, of course, the British prime minister, basically to recognize Russia as a, in his words, terrorist state, basically. 
it, it seems like he has a few of these buckets that he wants. He wants a no-fly zone. It seems like that is almost certainly not going to happen based on what we've heard from the U.S., from European allies, et cetera. He wanted this ban on Russian oil imports. That is something that President Biden did move on. We're going to get to that in a second. But where does it go from here as far as the allied response to this invasion? You know, I think the Poland thing is fascinating, as yeah. you kind of mentioned. You know, Poland is not just going to transfer those jets here. They're giving it to the U.S. as an intermediary. It's one more indication of what we heard from NATO Secretary General, that they believe if there's a no-fly zone here, this war will widen, and that more lives will be lost than are already being lost. That is such a hard thing to digest here on the ground. If you're Ukrainian and your house is being bombed, it, it's hard to fathom that. But the rest of Europe is looking that straight in the eyes. You know, the British are seeing this. They are worried that Russia will lash out. So there is this cat and mouse game of arming Ukraine without doing it so publicly that you're inviting attack from Putin. I mean, it's it's this diplomatic dance that we're seeing play out across the continent, Hallie. Cal Perry, live for us in Lviv. Cal, thank you so much. You know, you heard Cal mention a couple of things in these buckets as far as the U.S. response. One of those buckets, this new ban, right, that the president announced today on energy imports, Russian oil, gas, coal, no longer allowed here in the U.S. President Zelensky of Ukraine likes that. Look, he's thanking President Biden on Twitter for, in his words, striking the heart of Putin's war machine. He wants other countries to do the same. European countries, many of them, they're not ready to go there just yet. That is something that the president acknowledged. And he also said, hey, we've got a warning to oil companies here at home. Watch. We understand Putin's war against the people of Ukraine is causing prices to rise. We get that. That's self-evident. But, 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 it's no excuse to exercise excessive price increases or padding profits or any kind of effort to exploit this situation. Or, Amer or American uh, consumers. Heidi Presbola is at the White House. And Heidi, you can see the line that the president is towing there, right? Because on the one hand, there has been pressure from Congress to try to get this done. There's been pressure from Ukraine to do this oil import ban. There is also the economic reality that this may make gas prices spike, right? They're already at record highs. That is something that takes a bite out of people's budgets, right? Whether they're following the latest developments in Washington or not. It's a balancing act, it seems, for the White House. And that's why, Hallie, he's being upfront about the fact yeah. that this could cause some pain in the short term. He said that if you want to protect freedom, there's going to be a cost to that. Now, Hallie, he also had a message for industry there. Now, earlier I had spoken with an administration official who told me that this is really up to industry, that Wall Street is going to decide whether or not they pump more gas, whether they pump more oil, that this is kind of in their hands. And then you heard the president say in his speech that there's already 9,000 permits for these companies to go and drill more oil oil and warned there also in his speech of potential price gouging. Of course, we don't see any evidence of that yet, but this is still so new and so fresh. He's trying to balance it by telling people, yes, you should see some increases, but let's also be vigilant against industry taking advantage of this. Hallie? Heidi, you, let's also make a point here, too, right, that Russian oil imports account for a very small percentage of the total imports of oil into this country, right? It's less than 10 percent. It's not a ton. I talked with uh, the, the top economic advisor to President Biden today, Brian Deese, so I know you know. And he said, yeah, but we're seeing, you know, the extraordinary impact of these sanctions on Russia. The ruble is crashing. It's that economic squeeze that they're trying to put on Russia. Well, that is why we did this, Hallie, because to your point, while we are a small share of their market and this is unlikely to kneecap the Russians, because frankly, this is very lucrative right now. Their prices are skyrocketing ever since Russia invaded. We're a small market. Europe is a huge market. And what we've seen is that already, even in these few hours since we made this announcement, leaders such as the chancellor of Germany saying we need to move in this direction, like Boris Johnson in UK saying that this is something that we need to get to eventually. Now, the question is how long, but when that happens and when that trans transition takes place, that will be devastating for the Russian economy. The Russian economy, the Russian government, for instance, takes in about one third of its revenue from oil and gas, and Europe is, of course, 90 percent of its business. But this is viewed around the world as a moral imperative, and the United States is going first because we can afford to go first, Hallie. Heidi Presbola outside the White House. Heidi, thank you. You also have today the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency saying somewhere between two and 4,000 Russian troops have been killed in this conflict. As we're learning just now, the Poland says that it is ready to send MiGs, right, these Soviet-made jets, kind of indirectly maybe to Ukraine, but here's the deal. Those jets will first go to a U.S. airbase in Germany and then presumably 
once they're in U.S. hands, will then head over to Ukraine to help the Ukrainians in this airspace fight with Russia. Poland's planning to send along all their MiGs. They're the ones Ukrainian pilots are already trained to fly on. And then, of course, Poland wants the U.S. to backfill the jets on our end, basically, to Poland. Courtney Kuby is at the Pentagon. Courtney, like, there's a couple things here, right? This feels, first of all, President Zelensky has been wanting this. He wants these jets. He wants this help. He wants to get more competitive with Russia in this air fight, which, as you have said, and, and is the Pentagon assessment, Russia is, is probably doing, ha has more um, capabilities in the air right now. But this feels kind of convoluted. Poland's going to send it to Germany, even though they're closer to Ukraine, than the U.S. is going to get over to Ukraine. Why? Why is it unfolding like this? So that's the big question. And we can I can say now, according to a number of U.S. officials, the U.S. was not tracking any plan for Poland huh. to send these jets to Germany at all. So the conversation that's been ongoing for several days now between the U.S. and the Polish government is that Poland would potentially supply these MiG-29 fighter jets directly to Ukraine. The United States has said that they were they would support that. They were in favor of it. Look, it's it's a one sovereign nation providing an aircraft to another sovereign nation. The U.S. was not going to be a part of it. The only U.S. component that came in was if they were going to supply them with F-16s as a way to backfill so that Poland wouldn't be left without this important capability. That being said, the U.S. officials I spoke with said it's not really clear if they have the F-16s readily available to supply them with quickly. So they were looking at the possibility of maybe rotations, U.S. F-16s and U.S. squadrons going in and sort of uh, basing there for a short time. Even that looked unlikely, though. Then Poland made this announcement, surprising U.S. officials, many officials who I've spoken with now, they were not expecting this to happen. At this point, it's completely unclear whether any of this is even going to move forward, Hallie. That's so interesting, Courtney, especially because, again, President Zelensky has been wanting this and has been calling for this. What is the latest assessment from the Pentagon? We know over the last, let's say, 48 hours or so, it feels like Russia has stalled, based on what we've heard from them in the northern part of the country. Is that still the case at, you know, evening Eastern time Tuesday here? It is. So it's they are definitely stalled in the north in their effort to take the capital city, Kyiv. In fact, they've even Russia has opened up a new line of advance going towards Kyiv, which just really indicates that they Vladimir Putin knows that they're having a hard time encircling and isolating that city. So he's going to put more effort to it. So that answers the question. Is there any chance that he would back away from the city? No, he's actually the, the Russians are doubling down around Kyiv. The effort from the east is also pretty stalled. There's heavy, heavy fighting in the eastern city of Kharkiv. The Russians have not been able to take that in nearly two weeks. The South is a different picture, though, Hallie. The Russian military actually has made some advances in the South. It's a combination of factors, the main one being that they have a much easier logistical supply there because they have this, the areas of Donetsk and Crimea where they can bring in logistical support to their forces that are moving up from the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. So right now, Russia is pretty close to essentially creating a land bridge along the entire uh, shore there. So the Sea of Azov along the northern Black Sea, that's what Vladimir Putin is trying to do. He, right now, he is he's close to taking Mariupol. They've encircled the city. The, the assumption is, from here, they will move further west to the city of Odessa. It's a critical port city. The concern is that once they move there from the ground, there will be a, a decent size amphibious assault from the northern Black Sea to take that city, and then Russia will essentially control the whole southern part of the of the country all along the coastline, Hallie. Courtney Kuby, I'm glad we have you um, to bring us the latest from the Pentagon's perspective. I really appreciate it. So you've heard what's happening politically. You've heard what's happening militarily. How about from the corporate perspective? Because, boy, do we have some news breaking just in the last couple hours here. Big, big companies, companies you know, stopping their operations in Russia fast, in some instances, faster than we've seen before. Right before we came on air, PepsiCo announced they're going to stop selling some of their brands in Russia. Coca-Cola said the same thing within the last two hours. Same with Starbucks. Earlier today, McDonald's, Adidas, Shell, right? You see the logos on screen here. It's just the latest in what's been this exodus of Western corporations trying to leave or cut ties with Russia. And Yale School of Management says the business world is on notice, basically, in part because of all the pressure companies face if they don't. Big companies who are doing business as usual there are getting called out by investors and online. Joel and Ken is joining me now to talk about this. And one interesting piece of this, Joe, is that 
consumers are more aware of what's going on from the businesses that they use, right? You drink Coke, you buy a Starbucks coffee. In, in many ways, more and more Americans are wondering, well, what is Starbucks doing with the money that I give them? And are they supporting things that I don't want to support? Yeah, conscious consumerism is what I like to call it. My phone's been blowing up all afternoon here with all of these new announcements. And yeah, it's really major. And, it, and McDonald's kicked it off today by making their statement saying that they're temporarily closing all of their restaurants. And they say it is due to the concern about what is happening to people inside Ukraine. And so they're closing all of those stores in Russia. What's interesting about this is they employ tens of thousands of people. And there they are, McDonald's saying our values mean we cannot ignore the needless human suffering unfolding in Ukraine. But what they are continuing to do is to recognize the economic impact of what they do for individual people who work at their franchises. So they're going to continue paying their employees, they say, in Russia as this temporary suspension of their stores continue. We also have news from Starbucks, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Coca-Cola, very relatively brief in their statement, but Starbucks the CEO Kevin Johnson coming out and saying that the attack is unjust and horrific and they employ 2,000 employees uh, in Russia and so as these companies come out and say something it's because they're getting shareholder pressure investor pressure consumer pressure to do something more and as you say as some people think about you know how much they're paying at the gas pump part of the reason you don't see perhaps as much uproar if you will is that there's an understanding of the geopolitical situation and the suffering in Ukraine right now. Helen. Okay, but what about the perspective from Russia, Joe? Do they, you know, are they feeling it? Like, uh, it, it, how much of an impact does it have when, when, like, McDonald's pulls out, for example? Yeah, well, if you're living in Russia and you don't have access to Netflix and you don't have access to, uh, you know, other major social media platforms, McDonald's are closed and many of the major international brands are closed, you directly feel the soft power tactics of uh, these companies, if you will. You know, even though they are not representative of the U.S. government or any other country, these companies have diplomacy power, so to speak. And so it certainly changes things when it comes to access to any number of, you know, services or things that people rely on. So it's a it's a statement from the companies, uh, certainly aimed at uh, perhaps yeah. more of a U.S. or Western European audience but certainly impact felt on the ground in Russia. Joel and Kent live for us there in L.A. Joe, great to see you. Thank you. Back here in Washington, the very first January 6th defendant to go on trial has been found guilty on all charges related to his role at the insurrection at the Capitol. Guy Reffitt from Texas tried to storm the building armed with a gun and zip ties last year. Prosecutors had said in opening statements, and remember we talked about it on this show, that he, quote, lit the fire for the attack. He is now convicted of all the charges against him, including transport of a firearm in support of civil disorder, basically carrying a gun to this thing, and obstruction of an official proceeding. His family was outside the courthouse today and had one thing to say to the other January 6th defendants. Listen. Don't take a plea. Do not take a plea. They want us to take a plea. The reason that we have all guilty verdicts is they are making a point out of Guy and that is to intimidate the other members of the one sixers Ms. Ruffin, and we will all fight together guy Ruffin's wife there pete williams is joining us now um I, can i start there is she right i mean i don't know if you can answer that question but is, is this sending a message to others who are tied up in this investigation for what they did on the, at the capitol well first of all remember that 228 people had already pleaded guilty right. before guy Ruffin's trial so i don't know that you can say that that his trial or charging him or his decision to go to trial instead of pleading has encouraged other people to plead. I would think quite the opposite. I would think the fact that he got convicted on all counts would give others pause before deciding whether they want to go to trial. Because if you do plead and you do agree to cooperate with the government, as some defendants have done, or you do express remorse, right. as Guy Reffitt has not, then generally speaking, you, your chances are better at getting a lesser sentence.
Is there any extrapolation to other potential, you know, if it goes to trial, et cetera, for some of these other cases down the road that we can make from how this one turned out? So I think two things. One is it would appear that the federal government's plan for trying to take the jury back into the Capitol and tell them what it was like to right. be there on January 6th or what it was like to be a Capitol policeman outside on the 6th was effective. Hmm. Secondly, uh, of course, in this trial, there was overwhelming evidence. You had photos and videos of him. You had his own statements from the camera that he was wearing on his helmet when he entered the Capitol. You have the things that he told his family when he got back to Texas that were recorded by his son, and those tapes or those uh, audio recordings were played in the courtroom. And then you have the uh, 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 extra things about this case that aren't going to be in a lot of the others. He was one of the few people to actually carry a weapon when he came, a firearm, no, I shouldn't say a weapon, but a firearm when he came to the Capitol. And secondly, this business about him threatening his own children and threatening to shoot them if they told the police or the FBI, that's not going to exist in the other cases as well. So this was a, this in, in essence was kind of an easy one for the government. And I, I think that's reflected in the fact that the jury it's began it's deliberating three hours, at 10. Right. And the note from the jury says we've reached a verdict at 12.08. So two hours and eight minutes for yeah, deliberations. Yeah, so it's Not almost that long that. to elect a foreman, you would think. Right, right. Well, as you say, you laid out the reasons why, for them, it may not have been needing a ton of, you know, uh, deliberation there. There's also other January 6th news, which is interesting, Pete, and it is involving this former Proud Boys leader, Enrique Tarrio. He was arrested today. This indictment has come out um, in connection to the group's role in, you know, planning the attack, if you will. And I know that you have, have, have said something interesting about this, which is, it is the most information we've gotten yet that points to the fact that the government, you know, there's been this question, was the attack pre-planned? Was it a spontaneous riot, if you right, will? Right. And this indictment seems to be leaning in one direction. Well, this is the furthest the government has ever gone in that direction. So on one level, what this indictment does is add Enrique Terrio to the indictment that already existed for other members of the Proud Boys, saying that they came to Washington with tactical gear and they wanted to raise hell and try to discourage Congress from counting the electoral votes. But all those indictments in the past, including for the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters, have all said they wanted to have violence in the streets or maybe fight Antifa, but there was never a direct reference in any of these other court documents to an actual plan to storm the Capitol. This is the closest it ever, it ever comes. It says that uh, he was communicating with other Proud Boys. They had this little uh, sort of core group of people planning what to do in Washington. But one of them submitted this nine-page document called 1776 that said we should storm the House and Senate office buildings and then left a voicemail message that, according to the court documents, Terrio responded to by saying, well, I hadn't heard this message. You want to storm the Capitol. So it, it stops short of saying that there was an explicit plan, but it's the closest the government has yet gotten. And to Pete Williams, uh, following a lot of threads in the January 6th investigation for us. Pete, thank you very much. You bet. Still to come on tonight's show, police have arrested six teenagers in connection to that breaking news we told you about 24 hours ago on this show, that drive-by shooting outside an Iowa high school that ended in the death of one person. We're going to have more on that later in the hour. And we've been reporting kind of big picture on these Russian oligarchs who have been sanctioned. But who are they really? How connected are they actually? We've got more on one specific guy with really close ties to Vladimir Putin right after the break. We want to bring you today's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And as Ukrainians run from the fighting, most of them are ending up in Europe, but a few are being welcomed here into the U.S. And with the situation overseas getting worse, Americans who have family still in Ukraine are begging for something to change. Our Vaughn Hilliard explains. The frantic fleeing from Ukraine has left now more than two million refugees displaced. What led you guys here to being together here? Sure. Uh... Many of them with family in the United States, but unable to get approval to make the journey here, including seven-year-old Vladislav and 12-year-old Stanislav Kostuk. They are brothers, refugees who fled to Poland. Their parents stayed behind in their Ukrainian town of Zaborov to help defend the country. Here's a photo of their father taken Monday. The boy's nearest extended family is in America. But because the boys can't get official refugee status in the U.S., their uncle and a cousin who live in New York flew to Poland to care for them. That's all we're asking for is for the time being for the kids to just have a safe place to be. 
Their uncle went to the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw on Monday, but officials there declined the boy's ability to fly to the U.S. The U.S. Embassy's website explicitly saying such travel is not possible. It's seven-year-old boys, boy without his mother and father, you know. The Biden administration has yet to create an expedited refugee pipeline to the U.S. for Ukrainians. But Russia is currently shelling their home country. The oldest brother saying, without my parents, it's more difficult to adjust. Back in New York, Olha Rosanovsky and her son Michael wait. Olha is the boy's aunt and the sister of their mother. I feel really, really heartbroken and... Um... <laughs> yeah, I'm very worried about them because they are just two little kids. Hilliard is joining us now. And Vaughn, you feel that emotion and, like, you, you can't help but um, empathize there because these are just kids, right? So talk about who has been admitted to the U.S. from Ukraine to this point so far. Right. The only move at this point by the Biden administration is granting temporary protected status, Hallie, to Ukrainians who were already in the United States prior to March 1st. That's about 30,000 Ukrainians. Other than that, the administration has stood by what it calls humanitarian aid, sending tens of million dollars to the EU, which has granted temporary protected status to those Ukrainian refugees, unlike the U.S. at this time. There's a distinction that I think is important that I'd like you to explain between seeking refugee status and then seeking asylum. Explain that. Right. We, we've seen Central American migrants, Haitian migrants seek asylum. But in order to seek asylum in the United States, you have to be at the U.S. border or a port of entry, including the airport here. And the reality is, is that these refugees can't even board a flight to come to the U.S. because in order to get on an airplane for a U.S. bound flight, you have to be pre-authorized, which means even these Ukrainian refugees, including those two boys that you saw there in Warsaw, they can't go and get on a plane just to even come to the U.S. to try to see seek that asylum. Allie? Vaughn Hilliard, um, thank you so much for bringing us that reporting. I appreciate it. I know you'll watch for any updates as this develops. Thanks. Right now, you've got U.S. officials who also have their eye on some of these rich Russian people, these Russian oligarchs, these elitists linked to the Kremlin. They're hunting down their assets. And because there's so much secrecy around who these people really are, we thought we'd tell you more about who they are, why it matters, and why you should know about them. Tonight, let's start with Sergei Shemzov. He's the head of Rostec, this huge state-owned arms and technology conglomerate. He's also one of the eight oligarchs the U.S. said would be subject to these full sanctions, the highest level of sanctions. It means anything he owns, property, company, any assets that are at least half owned in the U.S. are all blocked. And this guy's ties with Vladimir Putin, they are deep. They lived in the same apartment building in East Germany in the 80s when they both worked in the KGB. That relationship has worked in this guy's favor. That's his yacht, 278 feet. He's got a villa in Spain. He's got offshore companies owned by his kids. Tom Winter is here with more on this now. Um, as we said, Tom, this relationship goes back decades. Talk about how important President Putin was to him and his family's success and power. And it's a relationship that he refuses to talk about. He gave his first U.S. interview uh, to a news organization, to our own Keir Simmons, last year. He was asked about that relationship that goes back to a rooming house in Dresden when both uh, Chemizov and Putin were in the KGB. And he said, quote, I'd rather not discuss their time together and what they did together uh, back then. But uh, Rostec, a company that referred to really the big arms and uh, aerospace uh, corporation of Russia, uh, it feels like a state-run entity. It's got its hands in an awful lot of subsidiary uh, companies. Um, it's a company that's made over a trillion rubles uh, in its last uh, last year, although certainly uh, doubtful that it'll make that much this year. I could talk to you about the hundreds of millions of dollars that he has. We can show drone video from the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project of his uh, uh, Costa Brava Spanish villa. But what makes him so important is not that he's a, somebody that's flown under the radar and is, you know, somebody who eats ice cream with Vladimir Putin, as we just saw. But it really personifies the inner circle of Russia right now in these oligarchs. You know, we think of different groups in society, like politicians, law enforcement, the business community, the criminals. Sometimes they intersect, right? Obviously, we know politicians can be investigated. Same with the business community. And sometimes law enforcement runs afoul here in the United States. That's how we kind of think of things, is some of the groups in society. In Russia, 
Hallie, it all mixes together. Yeah. You have, uh, at one moment, law enforcement can be helping out these oligarchs. Uh, at the next moment, they're helping out the government, and the oligarchs can be helping out organized crime. At the same moment, they're uh, kicking up money to the Russian government and the person who heads it, Vladimir Putin. So the whole society there is in a complex blender. And so when we see somebody like this get sanctioned, it's a real wake-up call for people inside that inner circle. And that's why we talk about it, and that's why it's so important to the U.S. government. Is there an impact to Americans, right? Because I look, you look at this guy, Chemozov, he's got this company that's a titanium supplier, basically. Boeing has announced they're no longer buying titanium from Russia, but they haven't said what they're going to do about their partnership with this company. What does that mean? How, pull on that thread a little bit. Right. So, titanium is so important to Boeing, because the 787, which is kind of their uh, flagship uh, aircraft, is really the aircraft uh, that uses the most titanium. It's, it's mostly uh, uh, mostly built out of it, at least the outer skin of it. So, yeah, certainly could be a problem for him, right? Uh, on top of that, uh, we've seen significant disruptions in the nickel market, in some of the rare precious earth uh, uh, materials markets, in some of the noble gases that are used inside computer chips. Some of that is because of trading issues. Yeah. Some of that is because of scarcity issues. We're just going to have to see how long this goes. It's really in Vladimir Putin's hands, and then it's in our hands in the United States as far as how long we want to have uh, these sanctions go on. But, you know, this information, Hallie, re really a result of, of a number of years of work we've done here at NBC News to get this information from deep inside the U.S. government, the intelligence communities, from law enforcement, uh, and then vetting it our own and, and looking at documents on our own to be able to kind of bring you a little bit of this inside look. That was my question, because, listen, we're, we're buds, you know, you, you don't speak Russian, you don't live in Moscow, you know, how is it that we're doing the reporting that we're doing? But I hear you when you say, listen, it's because we're working, you know, you are, you are getting information from your sources here on the U.S. side. That's right. It's been a seven-year effort, wow. uh, something that we saw where we realized that Russian organized crime was going to be a continuing issue here in the United States, uh, certainly as the efforts came up to hack into the DNC, all those sorts of things. We really started to key in on this issue. Okay. Who are these people and why are they important, Hallie? Glad you're bringing that to us here on NBC News Now. Tom, thank you. Breaking in just the last couple minutes, by the way, we've got new video in from the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, who is praising President Biden's decision to ban Russian oil. He says it's sending a strong signal. Look at this video here. He says it's sending a strong signal to the rest of the world, saying that this will let the U.S. hopefully, he hopes, weaken Russia economically and ideologically and politically. And to the Kremlin, he says this, either Russia respects international law and does not engage in war or it will have no money to start wars. He's also thanking U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson for his own plan to ban Russian oil imports by the end of the year. Coming up here on the show, the California mom who allegedly faked her own abduction is in court as we speak. We're going to go to L.A. for the latest on the case and whether she's going to have to stay behind bars. Plus, what critics call the don't say gay bill in Florida passes that state Senate. It is now waiting for Governor Ron DeSantis to sign it. We'll have more on why students are still protesting what's being taught in their classrooms next. Four men are facing charges for a wild plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. That trial got started today. We've got more details in a minute. But first, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Northeast Bureau, dramatic video shows the moment a dad tossed his toddler to safety from a second story window. Did you see that? It was during a fire at an apartment in New Jersey. As you can see, those firefighters, watch. Oof, oh man, they catch the dad. They had caught the boy before then. They're both doing okay. Luckily, neither of them were hurt too badly. They still don't know what caused the fire. From our Southeast Bureau, Florida's top health official making a controversial recommendation. He says healthy kids should not get the COVID vaccine. That is obviously contra what we're hearing from federal officials coming from the state's surgeon general even called vaccine mandates quote terrible harmful policies it makes florida the very first state to advise against the vaccine for healthy children again something federal officials have said is very clear and at our midwest bureau thousands of teachers in minneapolis went on strike today for the first time in more than 50 years union leaders say they want their demands solidified in a contract with the school district that includes boosting the salaries for support staff smaller classes and more mental health support for students Prosecutors are starting to lay out their case today in the trial of four men who were part of a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Or the work to show how that plan started in the early months of the pandemic, with these people angry over the state's COVID restrictions. We're talking about Adam Fox, Barry Croft Jr., 
Daniel Harris and Brandon Caserta, part of a group called the Wolverine Watchmen, all facing charges of kidnapping conspiracy. But Governor Whitmer is not the only woman elected to office who's faced threats and hate in recent years. On this International Women's Day, we take a look at this trend, an unfortunate trend that experts say is on the rise. The year 2020 brought a wave of women leaders to the highest levels of U.S. government. A record 149 women currently serving in the Congress, three women sitting on the Supreme Court, a fourth potentially by next term. And for the first time in U.S. history, a woman was sworn in as vice president. Madam Vice President, no president has ever said those words from this podium. But with the surge of women in power, experts say threats and attacks, both in person and online, surged too. Take Representative Ilhan Omar, one of the first two Muslim women to serve in Congress, who's gotten death threats from the public. Don't worry, there's plenty that will love the opportunity to take you off the face of the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, which tracks online disinformation, hate, and extremism, looked at online abuse targeting congressional candidates during the 2020 election and found female Democratic candidates were 10 times more likely to get abusive comments on Facebook than male Democratic candidates. Researchers say it could be because of a difference in party ideology. Whereas women in the Democratic Party really are seen as, you know, uh, pushing women's rights issues, pushing issues of racial justice. Um, and I think that really breaks with the status quo of power. Um, and so I think it attracts a lot of hostility. And when former President Trump continued to push his lie of widespread voter fraud, which didn't exist in the 2020 election, some state level elections officials like Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold became targets for telling the truth. Have you had threats to your family, to yourself? Yes, uh, death threats for just doing my job, for protecting uh, Colorado elections and making sure that Republicans, Democrats and independents have access. And experts say those threats are becoming more violent and more radical, pointing to the kidnapping plot of Michigan Governor Rutchin Whitmer over COVID restrictions. When the group initially came together, whatever that orientation was initially, it switched to something far more sinister and far darker and the size and scope of it was also unprecedented when looking at other types of militia threats uh, and anti-government threats in the United States. There have been some high profile Republican women who have received threats. Look what happened to the Iowa governor, Kim Reynolds, a Republican who got a threatening voicemail last year saying she should, quote, be hung for treason over imposing pandemic restrictions. I want to bring in now Danny Sabalos, who is following this trial related to this Whitmer plot for us. So, Danny, jury selection, talk strategy here. What does the prosecution want? What does the defense want as they begin this thing? The main question is basically going to be, who'd you vote for? Or do mm -hmm. you like this governor? Uh, any governor is going to be a polarizing figure in any state because in any state, Half the folks may have voted for one person and half the folks may have voted for the other person. So that's a critical question, is finding out where these jurors lie on the uh, Governor Whitmer question, politically speaking. Does it necessarily disqualify them? No, but it's important to know whether or not they can render a fair and just verdict. Another important question is, how much have you jurors seen about this very newsworthy case in the news, and did you form an opinion about it? Because Here's a lot of folks think it's uh, a juror's disqualified if they've even heard about the case. That's not true, especially in a high profile case. It's impossible. The real test is, given what you know about the case or what you've seen in the paper, can you still render a fair and impartial verdict? And if the answer is yes, then unless the defense uses one of their peremptories or the prosecution does, that juror should be able to sit. So who has the bigger hill to climb, like when you're putting on your attorney hat here in terms of laying out their case? Because the defense says the government basically orchestrated the whole thing because the FBI, they claim, you know, infiltrated the group. But the prosecution is saying, hey, we've got these secret recordings, these text messages that they think show that the, you know, that the government was, or that these, this group was united in their efforts. The government may have orchestrated this whole thing, and they used cooperating witnesses, informants, and uh, undercovers. And that's what the government does in all kinds of cases. In fact, that is federal prosecution 101. Get the guy's buddies, send in the undercovers, tape everything, make an airtight case. I've defended cases like that. And I can tell you the uphill climb here is going to be for the defense. These are really tough cases to defend. Even when you have a cooperating witness who is just as bad a guy as the guy that's in the defendant chair, uh, for some reason, it's just been my experience that even when you expose 
all of the bad things about this witness that the government has gotten hand in hand with uh, and made a deal with the devil. If they get up on the stand and they point at your guy and say, that's the guy that done did it, it just is really hard for the defense to overcome. Danny Savalos. Danny, thank you. Listen, I have a feeling, timeline-wise for this trial, what do you think? I was going to say, I have a feeling we'll be talking to you the next few weeks. We think it's going to last that long at least, right? I do. I think okay. it will. It's federal court. Federal court moves yep. fast. I think we still are looking at a few weeks. Danny Savalos, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We got a lot more to get to here on the show. Coming up after the break, we'll take you live to LA where a woman accused of faking her own abduction is in court as we speak. That's next. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police have arrested six teenagers in connection with a drive-by shooting outside an Iowa high school. Remember, we told you about this as it was breaking on our air last night. The shooting ended up killing one person, hurt two other people badly. The suspects are now facing murder and attempted murder charges. We'll stay on top of that story. Number two, the Florida Senate has passed what's been called the Don't Say Gay Bill. It would stop classrooms, pre-K to three, from talking about things like sexual orientation and gender identity. We've seen these big protests from students all across the state against it, but it is now on Governor Ron DeSantis' desk for his signature. Number three, Congress has passed a bill to make lynching a hate crime. It's named after Emmett Till the black teen brutally killed in Mississippi back in 1955. The max sentence someone could get under what now exists, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, is 30 years. Number four, this new study out says the Amazon rainforest is hitting a point where it could turn into a savanna, basically like a big grassy plain. 75% of the rainforest right now shows signs of trees dying, and scientists say they can't recover as easily from things like droughts and fires. It's a big deal because what happens to the Amazon could affect weather patterns all around the world. Number five, Apple today is rolling out a cheaper iPhone. It's an SE, starts at $429, a lot less than what a regular model costs. The budget-friendly option will even have 5G capabilities. The company hopes it'll push users to give up their older model phones that run on 4G. So there you go. So let me get up to speed on some breaking news that we're watching from out west. You've got the Sacramento judge literally in the last couple of minutes, releasing Sherry Papini from jail. Papini had been held there since last week. Remember, she's the woman accused of faking her kidnapping in this big headline story six years ago, back in 2016. She basically vanished near her house. This huge nationwide search went on. She turned up a few weeks later telling investigators she'd been kidnapped and beaten, even branded by the people who captured her. But the Justice Department... We've just learned in the last couple of weeks, says Papini was actually with an ex in Southern California the whole time. They arrested her last week. Miguel Almaguer has been reporting on this and joins us now with the breaking news. So bring us up to speed, Miguel. This court hearing, I guess, just ended. What's up? Yeah, Hallie, so the court hearing ended literally just moments ago. The, her conditions of release are fairly standard. Her bond is $120,000, money that it appears her family will put up for her release. She has some basic restrictions. She has to surrender her, fi her passport. She can't have any firearms or drugs. Uh, she also can't travel beyond Northern California, all things that were fairly routine. Now, the, the, the prosecution argued that she's a flight risk after exactly what you just mentioned, that she allegedly staged this her, her own kidnapping, then tried to flee the area for three weeks before returning to the area, saying she was kidnapped, something that prosecutors now say was all a hoax. So investigators say they, she was a flight risk, but the judge simply didn't agree, Hallie. Okay, so then what is, what is up with this for the next few months, right, as this legal fight plays out? I think the next preliminary hearing is middle of this month, just a couple weeks away. Way. Um, how does this go down? Well, it's likely this is going to be tied up in court for several weeks. Papini has maintained her innocence. The prosecutor says they've spoken to her ex-boyfriend who admitted to this all when he was questioned by federal investigators. Federal investigators then went to Papini and confronted her with the new evidence. She continued to deny it. She was then arrested. Now that this court process has begun, it'll likely take weeks, if not months, to, to yeah. wrap up. Papini insisting she was kidnapped. Prosecutors say it was all a hoax. Miguel, I have to think, you know, and, and for people who don't remember, this was a huge deal when this happened in 2016. I don't want to put you on the spot. You've been with our L.A. Bureau for a long time. I don't know if you covered this specific case, but, like, context-wise, this was national news. This woman that had gone missing, this huge nationwide search, and now a complete reversal, according to what prosecutors say, a total 180 and some really surprising evidence that they're presenting. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So this all unfolded in 2016. You know, she was a mother of three, happily married, according to family and friends. She went for a walk, simply vanished in the middle of the day. Investigators launched this nationwide search in multiple states for Papini. There was no sign of her other than her cell phone and earbuds that were left on the ground. Then three weeks later on, on Thanksgiving Day in 2016, she shows up along a highway, battered and bruised with chains around her wrists, and police say that she she was then taken uh, to the to the hospital where she divulged this story where she said she was kidnapped by two Hispanic women held against her will. Investigators say all along she was really yeah. here in Southern California with an ex-boyfriend trying to escape her marriage. Hallie. Was there anything that we heard from the judge today or in that sh you know fairly short hearing today, M Miguel, that surprised you that you didn't expect or was it pretty standard? Well, it was fairly standard, but what, the one thing that we found most interesting here was just how adamant the prosecution was that she was a flight risk. They said, hmm. you know, back in 2016, she ran for three weeks and had no reason to run for the law. They said law enforcement from across the country was on the lookout for her, and they couldn't find her. They said that is why she's such a high flight risk, but again, the judge simply didn't agree. Miguel Almaguer. Uh, Miguel. Welcome to the show. By the way, your first appearance. We're glad to have you. Uh, we hope to have you back. Thank you for that great reporting Good to be with you. on that developing news in L.A. Appreciate it. You bet. After the break. Did you hear about this? Aaron Rodgers going to be back with the Green Bay Packers. Plus, more MLB games might end up canceled if the league and the players associations don't get a deal tonight. We've got the latest on the lockdown. And if the season can be saved, Sam Brock's with us coming up. So it turns out Aaron Rodgers likes where he is. He's confirming today he is sticking with the Green Bay Packers, but he's saying any reports that he already signed that deal or the terms of the contract are not accurate. Some of the reports had him getting the biggest deal in league history. Either way, it's just about the end of a controversial stretch for the quarterback that included talk about retirement and wanting to force his way out of Green Bay, not to mention that whole back and forth about his vaccination status. He's still, stats-wise, considered one of the league's best, won a fourth MVP award last year, but he faces some big pressure. His Packers have not been back to the Super Bowl in 12 years. Other big sports news tonight. Any minute, we could find out if Major League Baseball will have a shot at playing its full 162-game schedule. MLB told the union yesterday that today is the last possible day to get to an agreement that would let all the games be played. And if you're saying, wait a second, didn't they already cancel opening day in the first two series of the season? Yes, but if they get a deal quick, they could maybe reschedule them. So they're still talking. They are still fighting. They are still fighting over money and a lot of money. The players are basically saying, hey, we want more of a piece of the pie. The owners like things the way they are. All of it, as you can imagine. Exhausting and frustrating to fans. And a new poll shows people are more than twice as likely to blame owners than players for these canceled games if they happen. Sam Brock is here with us on the MLB beat, um, our chief baseball correspondent. Sam, first of all, talks. Where are they? Are we going to get a deal by tonight's deadline? If I'm a betting woman, I say probably not, right? But, like, I don't know. You tell me. You're a lot smarter than me. I, I would agree with you. I would not bet on a deal getting done either. Also, can we call this hot stove with Hallie? I feel like there could be some sort of franchise potential there. What I would say, Hallie, is that these are very critical hours right now. The okay. fact that Major League Baseball has softened its language about not making up canceled games is a good sign they want to get a deal done. Here's why this deadline is so crucial, because once Major League Baseball dips below 140 or so games, the teams involved then have to give rebates to regional sports networks for those TV contracts. There was a lot of money involved there. So Major League Baseball, we're talking about the owners and management now, has built in a little bit of a cushion. They've already canceled two series. That's about six or seven games per team. If they start dipping a little bit deeper into that fat and they cut into bone, Major League Baseball is going to lose a lot of money. Nobody wants to see that happen. That's more incentive for the two sides to come together. So a couple of questions here. There's some urgency tonight. I mean, you're explaining why and why that is. Um, what happens if they don't, right? What happens if, as you say, they cut the fat, they hit the bone? I mean, are we looking at salvaging any part of the season at that point? 
One would certainly hope it was disastrous for Major League Baseball in 1994 and spilling into 1995 when they canceled 950, give or take, games. So far, it's been 91 games. Why would this be so bad on top of that? There are, beyond just the players, the concessionaires, the groundskeepers, clubhouse employees. There are so many people yeah. tied to Major League Baseball whose economic livelihoods are tied to Major League Baseball. Both MLB and the Players Union have now put up matching million-dollar funds to try to keep those folks to be able to pay their bills. As we know, there's so much going on in the world right now between rising gas prices, inflation. It's expensive. Rents are up. So there's all those folks who don't make a lot of money who are standing to lose a lot as well. You would think there would be pressure from all parties to get this done immediately. What's interesting, and you talk about the pressure piece of it and what happened in 94, we mentioned that poll. It's almost the exact opposite of 94 when fans blamed players more. Why do you think, based on your reporting of this lockout that you've been doing for us, why do you think it's different this time? Why are more fans blaming the owners now versus what they did back then? Yeah, anecdotally, I'm hearing the same thing. When you ask people what they think about what's going on, they say, I completely side with the players. I think there's been a paradigm shift in Major League Baseball with advanced metrics, a big part of this, where younger players are coming up earlier, Hallie, and they're making incredible contributions, in many cases, more so than veterans who are making a lot more money. And the younger players have to wait three or four or five years to get paid anything close to market value. That doesn't seem fair to anybody. We're also seeing, for years now, service manipulation. Teams will take these star players Players, they won't call them up until the end of May or early June just so that that player doesn't get credit for a full year and then they're backlogged another year until they can hit free agency. That doesn't seem fair to anybody. You don't need to know the X's and O's of baseball to know that that's not a great practice of how you treat yeah. your employees. All of that stuff has started to build up and I think is now a perception the players are in the right if you were to ask the average person in these negotiations. If you were to ask the average person what the hot stove is, they might not know that that's a reference to baseball in the offseason. But look, now we know. Now I know. I personally think Brock's inside baseball is like a better catchphrase. But Sam, I have a feeling we'll be talking again <laughs> on this soon. Um, thank you very much, my friend. Appreciate it. I'm making my best pitch. <laughs> thank you. Oh, God. Just, just, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. We love Sam Brock. We love you. Thank you for being with us. Um, I am actually out. I'm on assignment uh, for the rest of the week. So the next time I see you will be Monday. But you know we got you covered. Stephanie Gosk will be in the seat tomorrow. Same time, same place. Have a great week. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.